two, one, welcome back, the cross product. All right, so as you move along in your vectors or studying of vectors as an introduction, you're going to uh, learn about vectors. Of course, you have done addition of vectors, you've done subtraction of vectors, you have multiplied vectors by a scalar, you have taken the dot product, which was a new operator that you had to learn on vectors. And here's the last kind of operator on vectors that you would learn, which is the cross product. The cross product, the way that it is written, is actually super confusing for any student because when you begin, you typically do your standard multiplication of numbers by utilizing the x as just a multiplication symbol. Well, when you get to vectors, although I guess the x that we use is a little bit bigger, we do utilize this cross, which is really not a cross, but more so the actual standard multiplication kind of uh, operator, okay? which we do refer to as the cross product. And this, of course, happens only when you do have two vectors. Now, the vectors that you study and that you're going to be learning about the cross product with are going to be three-dimensional vectors. So that's the assumption that you can make. You're going to be working with three dimensions and especially in terms of the introduction. So this is something that you'd be learning in maybe your, your calculus and vectors course maybe your first linear algebra course as an introduction. Now, of course, this, we have to make visual in some way. And what does this exactly mean? Because if it's not just multiplication of two numbers and we have two vectors, what does this cross product mean? So it does have a specific way and it certainly does have some viewpoint, some intuition behind it. There are applications that use the cross product in physics, for example, uh, quite heavily uh, anytime you're going to be working with vectors. And that is to do with, for example, torque calculations. You can even do it in electricity and magnetism. Those items you typically will study a little bit further on. And the hope is that you learn the cross product beforehand so that when you do see it in your physics, for instance, you're not going to be freaking out and you're going to say, I'm not so sure what the heck this is. You're going to just go back and think, okay, I learned this in vectors. When you have two vectors, you can take this, okay, this special operator and it gives out something to us. Now, if you remember the dot product, the dot product between two vectors, the result was a scalar. So it was just a number. It didn't have any directions at all. The cross product, however, is not a scalar. It is actually a vector. So this particular operator spits out another vector for us. Now, it spits out a very special vector in three dimensions. So let me kind of give you an intuition and introduction to this. You can see this, that I've kind of borrowed this x, y, and z plane in, in here. And I want to be able to introduce, introduce this to you. So let's imagine okay, that this vector v1 okay, maybe is along the x-axis. All right, so I'm going to draw one, okay, which is something along the x-axis. Okay? That is my vector there. Then I'm going to draw, so this is going to be my v1 vector right there. That's this one. And then I'm going to draw my v2 vector. Now the v2 vector can be anywhere and so can the v1. It's just initially you may want to visualize it kind of in the x and in the y and then from there you know you can see what this cross product actually does and then you know we can do other examples to be able to view this. So let's imagine that v2 is actually in the y direction so it's directly in the y direction so we have two vectors in here now when you're doing the cross product the order the way that you write these does actually matter so for example if you're going to be writing v1 
crossed with V2, it is actually different, okay, than writing V2 crossed with V1. And I'm gonna give you the subtle difference uh, momentarily. So, like in the dot product, we know that we have an angle between two vectors. So if you draw two vectors anywhere, you know that you can find an angle in between them. We can certainly do that with the dot product, right? So we can find what that angle is. Now, the angle that we have found is always the, the smaller angle, okay, of the two. So, you know, you can think about there are really two angles. There is an angle which is, goes from here to here, and then there is an angle which actually goes all the way around, which is 360 minus this one. So, you know, we could have gone all the way through here, right? So that's also an angle, okay, in between. Now, these two are 90 degrees apart. So that green is actually 90 degrees, and that means the blue would have been 270 degrees because that makes up the full 360. So moving forward, and I mean, in the dot product, we've also done the same thing. We've assumed this. You always take the smaller angle in between the two. And so if you write, okay, V1, which is first, then you are moving from V1 to V2, right? So you can imagine that the angle sweeps from V1 to V2. So there is almost like a direction to the angle, right? So it goes in this direction. If you were writing, okay, V2 um, onto V1, then the angle sweeps the opposite way. So the angle would have been sweeping in this way. So it would have been going in this way. So there's almost like a counterclockwise and a clockwise way of thinking about this. Now, of course, you have to be in the plane of the actual two vectors, right? So as you're sweeping through these. Now, if it turns out, okay, that your actual sweeping okay, of the angle goes from V1 to V2. So I'm gonna assume that for the moment. So I'm gonna remove the other one. Um, then the way that we define the actual cross product is in this way. So it will be equal to the magnitude of one of the vectors, right? Which is the first one multiplied by the magnitude of the second vector, so far this looks like a dot product. Now in the dot product we had cos of the angle. Well, in the cross product, it turns out that it is the sine of the angle in between, where that angle is the smaller angle okay, in between. So it's going to be less than 180 in here. Now, with this, if you did just this, this would have been just giving you an actual scalar number. Now, our cross product is not a scalar number. So it does include this, which is a scalar. However, there is a direction. And the direction is going to be perpendicular to both of the vectors. It's going to be perpendicular to both of the vectors. So it starts in exactly the same spot. So in this case, it would have been origin. Well, having it perpendicular, it's going to either be up, right? Or it's going to be down with respect to these V1 and V2. So how do you know which one it will be? Now, we call that vector kind of the normal vector to both. So is it up or is it down? Because there is a difference, right? So if it's pointing downwards, they would be opposite to pointing upwards. So when you're doing the cross product, if you are sweeping from one V1 to V2, we have kind of invented this right hand rule. And the right hand rule is that you're going to put your hand in the direction of the first vector. So in this case, my V1 is in this way. So as you're looking at it, so you know it's pointing this way. And then you curl your fingers towards the V2, towards your other vector. 
and your thumb is going to give you the direction of that normal. So as you can see, it's upwards right there. So I am going into V1 and I'm going into V2. Now, when you are putting your right hand, it has to go in the direction. So when you curl, the curling towards, so now I am curling towards V2 in this way, it is towards the smaller angle. Because of course, you know, you can put your right hand in opposite direction. V1 is in this way. And you can curl to V2 through the, you know, the long angle all the way around, which would put your thumb downwards. But the right hand rule always takes the smaller angle. So it doesn't go this way because it would have to go, in, in our case, 270 degrees. So it goes in this way which goes the 90 degrees, which is the smaller angle, and it points upwards. It also means that if you're looking at it, so if you had a viewpoint of this, you know, and you had V1 and V2, and you were looking from the top, okay, um, on this, so you were looking from the top downwards. So if you looked at this from the top, so let's say that this was your V1, okay, and then this is, your V2. So we are sweeping in this way. So you notice that this is actually counterclockwise. And if you are going to be sweeping counterclockwise, then your normal is going to be pointing upwards. Now, if you're looking down and this is a plane, then upwards is actually obviously straight out of the paper that I'm writing on. So it would be up. And the way that we actually draw this, so if we wanted to point up, I'm gonna draw it right beside, we write a circle beside it and we put a dot. And the dot means it goes up, out of the page. Okay, now this, okay, if on the other hand, you were dealing with V2 and V1, so if you were looking at it in that way, then your angle is going from V2 to V1, which you can see is now clockwise. And clockwise would mean that now, if you were trying to use your right hand rule in here, so if you're looking at this and you're using your right hand rule, you have to put your fingers in the direction of V2. Now I have to almost swing in this way, right? That's V2, okay? Because it's coming out in this way on the way that you see. And that V2 right there, notice that if I put my right hand, I can't sweep towards V1. The only way I can sweep is to curl my fingers this way, which would be 270 degrees. That's not the way that you can do it. You do it through the smaller angle. So I can't keep my thumb and my hand in this direction. I actually have to turn my hand so that I can sweep it this way, so that I can sweep from V2 and take the short angle to V1. So the cross product from V2 to V1 would have had your right angle and pointing your finger down. So my normal would have been down. That's what you would have found. The angle's the same in both, right? And this actual calculation, so if you're looking at this, this magnitude and this magnitude, these are gonna be the same. The sine of the angle is also going to be the same, but if you switch these together, what is going to tell you what's going to be different is this normal. This normal, if you're going from V1 to V2, that particular normal is going to be going up in this direction because of the fact that we're using the right hand rule and we're going counterclockwise, okay, within here. If you're going from V2 to V1, now it's going to switch and that actual vector, instead of pointing upwards, it would have been actually pointing, so within here, let me draw this, it would have been pointing downwards in this way. That's what would have happened if it's the cross product from V2 to V1. That is tricky. 
and you should try to think about this right hand rule and then putting it okay into the direction of your first vector and then always curling your fingers towards your second vector along the smallest angle possible between them not along the largest angle between them and we can certainly calculate these we've calculated magnitudes we know how to calculate the sine of an angle so that's not a problem we can even find that angle in between by using the dot product so if you remember from the dot product i can put it up the link up above there for you again you should study the dot product before you do the cross product you can find the angle um, without any sort of hesitation right so if you remember that the dot product between the two vectors that you have is indeed the actual magnitude of the vectors multiplied by the cos of the angle and then isolating this so you can get cos theta which is the dot product between the two vectors divided by the actual magnitude in between so that's what you would have and now you can find the inverse right you can use the cos inverse to find your angle in between those two vectors so we can do that now if for instance you know your particular vectors okay that you have are given in cartesian coordinates then those cartesian coordinates those 3d coordinates do allow us to actually find the cross product in a much easier way now i'm not going to show the proof this time around for this to be able to show you that this is exactly what the cross product is but it is defined in this particular way so i want to just give you an example right of two actual um, vectors now these two vectors that we had we definitely would be able to find what the cross product is without anything special because we can see it so notice that what i have done in here is that my vector so my first one is three and then really it's just zero zero that's vector number one that's what i had my vector number two right here was simply zero and three and now if i wanted to find what the cross product in between these two are i can definitely do that i know what the angle in between is it's it's 90 degrees so in this case it's not a big deal so what you would have is you would need the magnitude of your first one so now the magnitude of this one is actually three right because the x and the z components are zero so it would have been the square root of three squared plus zero squared plus zero squared so that means it's nine and the square root of nine is simply just three so this is going to be three which is the magnitude of the first one this one is also going to have a magnitude of three the sine of the angle well in between here so this is 90 degrees in between one and the other well what is sine of 90 well sine of 90 is just one so what you have here you would find that this is just nine and then this is going to have to go in the direction of the normal now the normal since we're going from v1 to v2 then this would have been nine and your actual vector is going to be pointing upwards okay within here so it's zero zero one so that is your normal vector and you do take the actual unit vector for that particular normal that you have and now if you would span this out if you bring in your nine this is going to be zero zero nine and that becomes your actual cross product and the cross product is a vector right there so that is the vector that we would have now if we wanted to do the cross product from v2 to v1 so if instead we did v2 crossed with v1 in this case now i'm not going to do the calculations they're the same the only difference now is that my normal is pointing downwards so what you would find is that your cross product would have been this it would have been pointing downwards 
right? Now, the cross product doesn't mean that it gives you a unit vector out. It does have a magnitude which can indeed be greater than one or even less than one. That will depend okay, on the values, on these particular values, and of course, of the sine 90 that you have or sine of the theta. So the cross product, unlike the dot product, doesn't just give you a scalar, it actually gives you a vector. That's what it gives you. Now, if you really wanted to think about what those values okay, actually give you, so what these values give us, these ones right here, so if you wanted to know what these values give you, these values, believe it or not, if you take this all the way through, Okay, and you try to calculate it, it would give you the area of the parallelogram which is created by V1 and V2. So if I would draw these out, now let's imagine you know, we have something like this, and let's say this was V1, and then here, you know, this was V2, right here, then what it would do is it would find the actual area of this particular parallelogram within here. But that doesn't mean that it gives you a parallelogram back. It just means that the actual V1 magnitude multiplied by V2 magnitude, and then sine of the angle okay, that is created is going to give you the actual area of that parallelogram. And so for this, you know that the area of the parallelogram is nothing else but just base times height. Now the height in here, okay, of course, if it's not 90, we would have to make a 90, okay, in there. And then the angle, well, this is the angle, right? Well, what is that height? So this particular height that you see right here, this height, because we have a triangle which is created right here, well, that height is nothing else but the hypotenuse, which is the magnitude of the V1 vector, and then the sine of the angle, and that gives you this height. And that's exactly okay, what this will give you right here. Now, if that parallelogram, okay, as you're going through, okay, and it creates a bigger angle than 90, right? So as you're going through all the way, Okay, so within there, that doesn't cause us any issues. Okay, so within there. So between zero and 90, okay, as you're going through, we, we are indeed are going to get what the result is, okay, what that value is, okay, in terms of the sine of the angle. So it's always positive. If it's more than 90, it's still not a problem. Right? So that particular, you know, if it's more than 90, it still gives us the height, okay, which is still going to be positive. So that's what it gives. It gives actually the area of the parallelogram that is created. But overall, the cross product needs to have, in this case, right, the actual vector. So if you were doing the cross product the way that I drew this, and let's say that this is on a plane, then your V1, if I wanted to find the cross product here, and this was my V1 crossed with V2, then yes, you know, this would have given us what the actual scalar value is, but we need the vector. So the normal, well, you are going from V1 to V2, so it's down. Notice that it's clockwise, right? So if I put my right hand, it's not going to be right hand this way and then curling this way. I have to curl towards the angle. So I have to turn my right hand and then curl. And that means that the actual vector okay, is pointing into the paper. And into the paper is actually done in this way. We put a circle and then we put an X that it's going into it. And you know, as we had in the before, if we put a circle and if we put a dot, it means it's coming out of the paper. So those are the two differences that we have. That right hand rule, okay, is is important. And you're going to be going all kinds of, you know, crazy things and you know, you might be writing a test and people are going to be 
looking and then pointing and then twisting their arms. Um, so, you know, that's definitely something that I had done as well, especially when I got into university and doing, you know, the applied physics case, applied sciences components with electricity and magnetism, for instance, you're always thinking about that. But you can think about it clockwise and counterclockwise. So notice here V1 to V2 is going clockwise. So in that sense, so as it's going to clockwise, that means it's going to go into the page. If it's going counterclockwise. If we went from V2 to V1, that was the cross product. Now the right hand rule is very easy. It's coming out of the page, right? So that's counterclockwise within there. So that is the concept behind the cross product. Now, you still are going to be wondering, what in the world am I going to be using this for? Okay, I can get an area of a parallelogram, okay, but yet, you know, it's telling me that this is not really just the area of the parallelogram because it's a vector. You are correct. It's not until you study physics and then the applications, which I'll try to do a couple, okay, as videos as well, that you get a chance to see right, that there, these vectors that are created out of the cross product are actually meaningful and they do exist, okay, in nature that we see, which is really neat. Now, before I end the video, you know, I wanted you to have a very much simpler way of finding these cross products, especially if you are given two vectors, in Cartesian coordinates. So if I gave you two vectors, so if I said you have your V1 vector, and then this V1 vector, let's you know write it out. So this is the V1x component, V1y component, and V1z component. And then you were given the second vector right here. So you were given V1, sorry, this would be V2x component, V2y component, and V to Z component, and you wanted to find the cross product, you certainly can find the magnitude of this. That's not a problem. You can find the magnitude of this. You can find the angle in between by using the dot product as I showed you right here, right? So you can certainly do that. But that's long, that's very long. Now it turns out that you can find the cross product in between. So this is going to be V1 crossed with V2 in this extremely neat way. Now, this particular way, so what you do is you actually create so something which is called a matrix, which you may study okay, a little bit later, and I'm introducing it to you now. So it's uh, a it's an it's it's an actual um, in, in, in even to explain it as you see it for the first time I'm smiling to myself and, and telling myself wow I can't actually explain this matrix so it is an entry system where you can put vectors the value the components of the vectors into this and you list them you can actually list as many as you like so the rows themselves, so as you're going to have these particular rows, this is my first row, my second row, and my third row, that's what we're going to use for the cross product, where that first row is actually going to be the vectors that we have, i, j, and k. So if you remember, these vectors are the unit vectors that are defining our coordinate system in three dimensions. So that's going to be your first entry into your row. It has I, J, and K. Your second entry is actually the components, the values under those I, J, K of your first vector. So this would have been V1, X. This is going to be V1, Y. And this one is going to be V1, Z. And then your last one is going to be your second vector. So your components of those, which is going to be V2X, V2Y, and V2Z. So you have entered three. Now, these matrices, so this, this matrix, 
it doesn't have to be just three okay, um, vectors that I'm inputting in there. In fact, it could have many. But because you're studying three dimensions and you're studying the cross product, you are just going to be entering these three. So first one is always i, j, k. The second one is always your leading vector in your cross product. And then your third one is going to be your second vector in your cross product. And that the values, the x, the y, and the z are associated with the i, the j, and the k. Now you might say, okay, well, that's great. Now, why do I need this? Okay, well, you need it in order to find what the cross product is. And the way that we find the cross product, we start with the top. So we start with this particular top value right there. So we circle it. So we ask ourselves, what is going to be the component of the I? And so we write it down. So we said, okay, so this is I right here. And now this I, we're going to cross out. So we cross out this particular, okay, and this particular. So the row and the column that go with the I, so all the ones down, the components of the I get crossed out, the J and the K gets crossed out, and you are just simply left with these two right there. Now, when you look at this, then what you're going to be doing is you're going to be going, okay, in the opposite direction. So you're going to say, I want to take V1, Y, multiply it by V2, Z. That's first thing that we're going to do in here. So that's going to be V1, Y, multiplied by V2, Z. Notice that they're on the diagonal. And now we're going to subtract the other two from each other, which is V2Y multiplied by V1Z. So that is going to be V2Y multiplied by V1Z. This is the component, the first component of the I. So this is in your X direction. So when you do that, it will give you the X direction of your vector of the cross product. And now the next item that you do is you move along within here. So this I'm going to remove. So let me remove this. Okay, let me clean this up again. So now we have done this already. Now we shift over to our J. And now we write out our J. So our J, now as you're going, your I notice that your i was positive now as you move over to the j we're going to alternate between positive negative positive so now we're going to say negative j that's going to be there and now we want to be able to find out what that value is okay of that j component so of the j component we're going to cross out. So now notice it goes down and it crosses out, okay, in this direction. And it leaves me now another two values. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to take V1 times this, okay? So this is going to be the multiplication of these that we have. It's going to be V1x multiplied by V2Z. And now again, just as in the other one with the I, we're gonna say minus, now it's going to be minus these two. So notice that they're always on a diagonal. So it goes this way multiplication and this way. So it creates this X. Those are the two that we multiply together. So that's gonna give me V2X and then V1Z. And that is now your second component, okay, that we have of our normal, okay, the actual cross product. And then the last one that we have, so once we do these right here, I'm gonna make them, I'm gonna shrink them. So here is my last one. 
So if I remove this, okay, let me clean this all up. Now we're going to be moving along and we are going to be circling, okay, this one. Now it's the K. So notice it goes along each component. First the I, then the J, but notice the J is negative, and now the K. And now the K is back to positive. So it goes positive, negative, positive. And now again, you're gonna be crossing off, so this, and you cross out that, and now it leaves you, and now you can probably guess within here, so it's gonna be this times this, and then subtracted from this times that. And that will now give me, so within here, plus, so I'm gonna write it out, V1X multiplied by V1Y, and then minus V2X times V1Y. And those are your components. This is the third component that you have in here. Now, when you first see this, super confusing, and you might think, oh my gosh, I have to memorize this thing, where I have to memorize these components in here so that I can find my vector. No, please don't. Please just, mem what you're gonna memorize is the mnemonic with the matrix. So let me go back to that first initial example that we did. So, and then I will show you how do you use this. So the example was, we had V1, which was equal to three, zero, zero, and V2, which was equal to zero, three, zero. And now if you wanted to find the cross product between them, then what you're going to do is you're gonna draw out your matrix. You're gonna be putting in the values. The first one's always I, J, K, right? So these are the unit vectors that define our coordinate system. Then you're going to put your first vector. So that's gonna be three, zero, zero. You're gonna put your second vector, zero, three, zero. And now you proceed to find the cross product. Where the cross product now will be, I'm going to cancel off. So now notice we're gonna go along my I. So I'm gonna be canceling this, okay? And then canceling that. And I'm only going to be working with those four values in the bottom right corner. So my result is, so you have your I, so this is gonna be your I component that you have in here, that's my I component. And now it's going to be zero times zero, which is zero, right? So this is gonna be zero, minus the other diagonal, three times this, which is also zero. So this gives me zero in the I component. That's my first one. Now you move over to the second one. So let me clean this up. And now you move over and you're gonna be working with the J. So this is your J and you're gonna be crossing these out completely. So that's the J, so it crosses out that entire column and then the entire row. And now in that J, the one thing you must remember that it is negative. So this is going to be negative in here. And now you're going to be multiplying. So three times zero. So that's gonna be your component of your J. So that's zero minus zero. So again, this, okay, well, zero times negative J, it's gonna be still zero J, right? So the negative doesn't matter in this case. If it was a number, it would. And then lastly, so your last item that you do is you're going to be crossing off, so this is through your K, so this is your K, and now you're going to go ahead and multiply, and notice what you get is, you're gonna get three times three, which is nine, right? So that's gonna be your last component, nine, minus zero times zero, which is zero, and this is in the K direction. So that's gonna be plus, and this is nine K. And that your vector, if you're gonna be writing it in Cartesian coordinates, then this is zero, zero, and nine. And that's exactly what we got through using right here. So notice zero, zero, nine, 
that was what we did. Because we knew here visually, we can see 3-3, three, three, and then we knew that it was going to be up by the right-hand rule or the counterclockwise. So we knew that it was going to go up. And then we found out what the magnitudes of each of the vectors were. We multiplied it by the sine of the angle in between them, and we got our 0, zero 9. But this is way easier to be able to do. When you have just vectors, you can just write this out and then start crossing things off within here. And you can make this as complicated, so meaning you can take two vectors that are not really this nice. You can take you know very mean vectors and then find what the cross product is. And that's what I'm going to do as a final example in here so that you can utilize this for yourself. So here is an example of, let's say, two vectors. So maybe you have a vector 1, negative 2, maybe 5. That's your first vector, and you want to cross it with your second vector. And then maybe, let's say, this was 0, this was 3, okay, and this was 1. So let's say we had these two vectors. These are not very nice vectors. It's not very easy for me to visualize, do the right-hand rule, and then see what happens. It's much easier to just say, okay, you want the cross product, you want to find the vector that actually is perpendicular to both of these vectors, right? And I want to find what the, each component is, great. So I can do that by going, here's my matrix, I, J, K. Write down your first one, 1, negative 2, 5. Write down the second one, 0, 3, 1, and now find each of the components. So first component, okay, so here it is. That particular component is going to be, now this one is positive, remember, this is negative, this is positive. So this is the positive value. So I'm going to have negative 2, um, so this is going to be negative 2 times 1, which is negative 2 minus 3 times 5, which is 15. So that's going to be negative 17. That's this component right there. That's my first one. There we go. So that's done. My second component, so I go across this. Now I know this one is negative right there. So this is going to be the negative value of whatever I find. So that's going to be 1 times 1. So that is 1 minus 0 times 5, which is 0. So this is going to be 1, but it is negative right there. So it's going to be negative 1. And then for my k component, as I go through this right there, this is now going to be, here's my k. I'm going to cancel these off. It's positive, and it's going to be 1 times 3. 1 times 3, which is 3. And then 0 times, well, that's going to be 0. It is positive, so this component is three, and now you found your cross product. That's how you can do it. So you have now found the vector directly, okay, within here. And just to visualize this and show you that it's, you know, um, pointing out, okay, within there from one to the other, let me pop up math3d.org. Here it is. Let me just add these. So these are going to be the vectors. So here's my first vector that I had, which was 1, negative 2, 5. So that's my first vector. Here's my second vector. This one's 0, 3, and 1. So there you go. So th that's those are my, my vectors. And then so here, if I you know shift this over, okay, let me see if I can move these around. So those are my vectors, okay, that I have, okay, in here. Now one negative two. So notice this is one negative two and five. One negative two and five. So that's one. The one to the left that you see, right? So that is your v one. And then your V2, the 0, the 3, the 1, which is the one pointing this way. So if I was doing my right-hand rule, right? So what should happen, so my right-hand rule, so I have to go along this vector. 
right? But I can't go in this direction and curl towards the other vector because that angle is much bigger, right? So I take the smaller angle. So I'm not gonna be going and curling this way where the actual pointing, okay, would be there. Okay, it's gonna be pointing in. I have to take my right hand, point it along. So notice like it's weird, you're always gonna be flipping. This is what I mean on tests. You're gonna see people kind of going strange or when they're doing their assignments, you know, like how does this go? So here you have to point your right hand, you have to now curl, curl, okay, towards the actual vector, okay? And this is gonna be inwards. Now, when you're watching this, this is coming out at you, right? So because the video that it has, it, it has the mirror image, it's pointing out. But it's actually pointing in, right? So it's going in that direction. And if I'm gonna add that vector, so my cross product in here, so notice it's gonna be negative 17, then it's negative one, and it's going to be three. And there you go, it's pointing out into there, right? So it's pointing into the actual, um, so right there. So if I you know, flip this over and notice, you can see it's gonna be 90 degrees, okay, to both right there, and it's pointing way out there. That's what we would have. So this is really cool in this Math 3D that you can you know, do this, it doesn't, because I'm actually running this, it doesn't let me swing as nicely, but here it is, right? So as I take this vector and it's pointing towards me, okay, right there, and those other two vectors are there. And now it is, you know, you can actually curl in here. And again, my, my thing, the way you see it is it's pointing into the screen, but it's pointing out, okay, towards us, right? Very, very neat to be able to see that. So that is the introduction to the cross product. There's a lot in here. I obviously have not proven why does this matrix work? Because it takes quite a while. And to be honest with you, if you are starting these vectors, you know, using and knowing this tool is useful to be able to calculate the cross products. So that is really useful. If you wanna know where this actual proof comes from, you you can definitely leave some comments and then you know maybe eventually I'll get to creating a video but at the moment I just wanted to introduce this cross product to you um, so that's what you have now because you have a sign of the angle in between the two vectors don't forget that if the vectors are collinear so if the angle is zero between them right um, you know, so if they're pointing in the opposite directions, okay, then the sine of 180 is zero and the sine of zero is also zero. So when they're collinear, then you have a zero vector. You can't, you, you're not going to, you're not going to find your actual cross product. So that cross product only works when the angle is going to be less than 180. Um, and it's not obviously zero. All right. Because in that case, you know, if it is zero, they're just lying on top of each other. You can certainly um, find a normal vector uh, that would be at a 90 degree, but that's not what the cross product does. So this cross product based on the definition, you'll notice that you can't have your angle equal to zero or 180. So it's going to be a little bit more or it's going to be, you know, more than 90. All right. Thanks for watching, very long video. Um, I hope that you found the examples and the visualization useful. You know, you can keep playing, you know, the right hand and, and seeing, okay, what happens and in which direction does it go, right? Um, and get acquainted with that. Bye everybody.